Welcome to this week's Echo Diabetes in a Time of COVID-19 webinar session. I'm Dr. Nick Kutcheris, Program Director and Pediatric Endocrinologist at Stanford University. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from. Thank you for being a champion for people living with diabetes. We're grateful for the unrestricted educational grants that we received from Nova Nordis and Pfizer Inc. that make this program possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have access to routine specialty diabetes care. Even before COVID-19 pandemic, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal. We must recognize that poor outcomes for people with diabetes on a population level does not reflect patient, quote, noncompliance, but rather system failure. And we as providers in a health system must change our approach to focusing on diabetes, outcomes, and costs. Data from 191 million people enrolled in health plans that report HEDIS results to the National Committee on Quality Assurance illustrate system failure for patients with diabetes. In 2018, less than one third of patients with type one and type two diabetes had A1C values at target or less than 7%. Even more concerning as demonstrated here on this slide, 30 to 40% of patients with type one and type two diabetes had A1C values greater than 9%. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes patient risks and vulnerability to infection and complications, including COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are being able to achieve glycemic targets. We are living in unprecedented times with COVID-19, but systemic racism and health inequalities have been endemic to the U.S. COVID-19 is making these injustices more clear. We must come together as a medical community and change our practice. We must act. When the mortality rate from COVID-19 in Black Americans is at least twice, if not five times as high as the mortality rate from whites, we must act. When marked racial disparities in diabetes management exist, and prior to COVID-19, we must act. When Black Americans with diabetes with equivalent socioeconomic status as white Americans are less likely to be prescribed intensive insulin management regimens, newer medications, diabetes technologies proven to improve diabetes outcomes, we must act. We must act and recognize systemic racism and implicit bias that are also occurring within our medical community and practice today. Our leadership team and faculty are committed to promoting health equity through our program and combating systemic racism in the US. We're committed to action. Here at Stanford, we're partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the United States on this this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized hub and spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities, improve health outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Zoom-based clinics led by multidisciplinary faculty from academic medical centers and community organizations provide community providers with education, case-based learning, and expertise they need to treat patients within their own community. We have an exciting series of presentation, all of which made available on-demand sessions after their live presentation. You can access these on-demand sessions on our website, diabetescovid.stanford.edu. You can also access information on our live webinars, patient and provider diabetes and COVID resources, and soon to come an FAQ with answers to questions asked during the webinars, as well as the questions submitted during the live webinar registration process. For our on-demand session, we'll address the high-impact follow-up questions from our last session, a lecture, and we will then address pre-submitted questions from an audience member, submitting questions during the registration for our live webinar. Our case presentations are not available for the on-demand webinar. We're fortunate to have a national faculty from over 12 ECHO programs and organizations around the country. Thank you all for um, uh, for joining and making this program uh, possible. We're now going to move on to our um, didactic portion, and I'd like it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rehan Lal, who's a pediatric and adult endocrine faculty at Stanford. He's uh, studied electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley 
His two sisters were enrolled in the diabetes prevention trial, DPT-1, and were found to have antibody positive um, and developed type 1 diabetes. To help all his brothers and sisters with diabetes, Rayhan decided to switch career paths and pursue clinical medicine at UC Davis. He completed a four-year residency program in internal medicine and pediatrics um, at the University of Southern California, working with underserved uh, patients at Los Angeles County Hospital. Rayhan then completed an adult uh, and pediatric endocrine fellowship at Stanford University. He now works on autonomous or closed loop insulin delivery systems with his mentor, Dr. Bruce Buckingham. Uh, Dr. Law uh, collaborates with many, many members of the Stanford Diabetes Research Center industry and open source diabetes community in effort to bypass the biological, technical, and human factors limitations of the existing devices. Rehan, it's a pleasure uh, having you um, part of our program, and thanks again for taking the time to um, present today. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to you to share your screen. My pleasure, Nick, and thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. I remember when we were initially talking about uh, this project, I thought, well, you know, we are uh, going in for the long haul. This is going to be a longitudinal project. So wouldn't it be great if at the end we could sort of summarize what's been happening with the research since this all began. So that's what I'd like to do today. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, at the end of this activity, we would like you to be able to critically review the current literature on COVID-19 and diabetes and understand what we have data for and what is the quality of the evidence for the data. So first of all, I just wanna get into how do we think about studies uh, what work has been published since we started Echo Diabetes in the time of COVID back in May? So we begin with our evidence pyramid here. Um, it, in the early days of evidence-based medicine, we talked about sort of a hierarchy of evidence. And at the base of that pyramid was a lot of observational studies. These included case series and reports, case control studies, cohort studies, and then we'd start to get into sort of interventional studies with randomized control trials, and then systematic review and meta-analysis sort of being at the top of that pyra pyramid, and things get more valid as you go upwards. Well, we soon realized that that is a uh, very, um, uh, a very perhaps theoretical way of looking at things, and that the reality is that each of these trial designs blend together. So Murad in 2016 showed the evolution of this pyramid and sort of the different ways that people have thought about it and perhaps figure C on the right there is the best way to sort of look at it where there isn't necessarily this huge gradation. Each of these study designs sort of blends into one another and the systematic review and meta-analysis is just a lens through which we view other studies. Um, and I bring this up because um, it's oftentimes uh, very uh, unhelpful to be so dogmatic as to say, you know, we're not going to listen because this was the least valid of the evidence. Um, after all, this whole pyramid, the evidence pyramid itself is expert advice, right? So it's not, it's not based on any randomized control trial. Um, and I want to sort of bring your attention to this idea of, well, we have now this new phenomenon of COVID-19 and we have a lot of questions that need answering about it. And so I would say anytime that you're thinking about one of these questions, ask yourself, you know, if I had all the money in the world, how would I answer this question in the best way possible? And a lot of it comes down to ethics. Um, you know, randomized control trials, especially uh, when you have a pandemic that's killing a lot of people, we have to think about uh, what we're doing in terms of study design. So for example, think about trying to design a study that assessed the efficacy of masks, for example. Uh, 
we have a pretty good inkling beforehand that masks probably do a good job. So are you willing to put people at risk with a randomized control trial to test that hypothesis? Uh, similarly with vaccines, well, you need people who are exposed to COVID to evaluate whether something prevented it or not. So again, the question becomes, well, how do you test that? Do you just send people into the wild? Do you create a weakened genetic strain of COVID and, and see if that infects people? There's many different ways of thinking about this. And then the regulatory side on top of that for vaccines is even more interesting and uh, could be a talk unto itself. But let's talk about the search uh, here real quick. So basically I search PubMed for diabetes and COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, found in the title. I set our publication dates to be after the initiation of our echo sessions. Um, and this was about a week ago. So there were 317 publications at that time. I did redo the search uh, yesterday evening and there were 350. So this is a clearly uh, dynamic field and there's always going to be more publications. And not unexpectedly, when a new disease strikes, we have to make hypotheses based on what we know. So that becomes expert opinion. And we have to define the problem with observations because if we don't define the problem, then we don't know if any of our strategies or mitigations are having an effect. Uh, so only once we identify the problem can we test causality and interventions. And just to give you a sort of summary of this, amongst those 317 publications from a week or two ago, uh, the vast majority, 273, were expert opinion, observation, case series. Um, and there was one supposed clinical trial, but that was actually only a protocol. And there were 43 meta-analysis or reviews, but keep in mind, again, that meta-analysis or review is a lens through which we are looking at largely observational studies. So I broke this down into categories of questions that we might want answered. Um, so the first question is, is someone with diabetes more likely to develop COVID-19? Um, among the whole population testing positive for COVID-19, how many have diabetes? So. Uh, there was a meta-analysis um, uh, done uh, earlier in the year, um, and it was titled, Does Having Diabetes Increase Chances of Contracting COVID-19 Infection? Um, and so what they did was they pulled uh, international studies from the US, Italy, China, Iran, and India, and they looked at what is the prevalence uh, in the entire COVID-19 population of diabetes against what is the prevalence in the general population in the same age group as the preceding column. And they found that those were close enough that they would be willing to say uh, that they are appro approximately the population prevalence of the disease. So in other words, you're just as likely to find diabetes um, in the COVID population as in the non-COVID population. So um, while diabetes increases severity of disease and mortality once infected, it does not appear from this data to uh, increase susceptibility. So the next question is, if someone with diabetes gets COVID-19, how do outcomes compare to the population without diabetes? And I think this is where we probably have the most studies coming out. Um, uh, this was a meta-analysis, again, looking at um, multiple observational studies. So uh, diabetes um, mellitus is associated with increased mortality and severity of disease in COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, this was a systematic review, meta-analysis and meta-regression that included 6,452 patients with diabetes. Type was unspecified from 30 observational retrospective studies that had been done prior. They found that there was a relative risk of mortality of 2.12 um, and it's pretty, pretty significant heterogeneity in those studies a relative risk of uh, having increased disease severity of 
uh, again, pretty hetero, uh, a, a pretty heterogeneous group of studies. ARDS, a relative risk of 4.64, uh, but with a wide interval and disease progression 3.31, again, with a pretty wide uh, interval. And this was influenced by age and hypertension. Another study titled is Diabetes Mellitus Associated with Mortality and Severity of COVID-19 was another meta-analysis with 16,000 patients with diabetes type unspecified from 33 international observational studies. They got found a pooled odds ratio of 1.9 for mortality and a pooled odds ratio of 2.75 for disease severity. Next, we had a retrospective observational study, um, uh, which was the association between obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension with severe COVID-19 on admission amongst Mexicans. We're about 23,593 patients in Mexico evaluated for respiratory viral infections at the Mexican Institute of Epidemiologic Diagnosis and Reference. 78% uh, tested negative for any viral infection, 16% were positive for COVID-19, and uh, the remainder uh, tested positive for other viruses. Um, patients who tested positive for COVID-19 had a higher pro proportion of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. However, these factors may have been in intermingled, and uh, these are not unique individuals with any of these characteristics. And uh, Barron in 2020 did a retrospective observation study association of type 1 and type 2 diabetes with COVID-19 related mortality in England, a whole population study. And these were one of the two NHS studies that we have highlighted uh, during uh, a lot of our sessions. So NHS data was compiled to assess COVID-19 mortality in those with diabetes was adjusted for age, sex, deprivation, ethnicity, and geographical region compared with people without diabetes. The odds ratio for inpatient COVID-19 related death was 3.5 uh, with a confidence interval of 3.2 to 3.9 in people with type 1 diabetes and 2.0 in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, so certainly sobering information and, and this was in a lot of popular press um, when it came out, uh, just saying that there is a significantly increased uh, risk of death in people with diabetes who are hospitalized with COVID. Um, these effects were attenuated um, when also adjusted for previous hospital admissions for uh, coronary heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, or heart failure. And what factors are associated with worse outcomes in those with diabetes? Um, so there was a retrospective observational study by Chen, clinical characteristics and outcomes of patients with diabetes and COVID-19 in association with glucose lowering medication. Um, and this was uh, 136 out of 904 patients uh, with diabetes who, who had mostly type two at the Central Hospital of Wuhan, and uh, risk factors for higher mortality amongst those with diabetes included age with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.09, so not, not too significant, CRP uh, with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.12, um, and then a poor prognosis amongst those with diabetes was associated with heavy insulin use uh, with an adjusted odds ratio of 3.6. She in 2020 uh, did a retrospective observational study, clinical characteristics and risk factors for mortality of COVID-19 patients with diabetes in Wuhan uh, with a two-center retrospective study. Um, and in this case, there were 153 out of 1,561 people with COVID who had diabetes um, at these two centers. Uh, diabetes was associated with ICU admission, 17.6% versus 7.8%. was associated with fatality, 20.3% versus 10.5%. And in hospital, death with diabetes was associated with older age and hypertension, sort of independent contributors 
uh, with male gender and CVD being other important factors. Uh, the, the glucose hypothesis is one of those that a lot of people are uh, suggesting, but uh, we don't necessarily have great evidence for yet. Uh, it's growing. So they, there was a meta-analysis, does poor glucose control increase the severity and mortality in patients with diabetes and COVID-19? Um, they found two studies that met their inclusion criteria, and they separated outcomes by blood glucose greater than 180 uh, and blood glucose less than 180. Um, and this is the relative percent in each group for ARDS, AKI, acute heart injury, and all-cause death. And those with the BGs greater than 180 um, had higher percentages of all four. And Lee looked at newly diagnosed diabetes and its association with a higher risk of mortality than known diabetes in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Um, there were 453 patients admitted to Union Hospital in Wuhan. Um, they were classified as either having normal glucose, hyperglycemia, uh, newly diagnosed diabetes, or known diabetes. And the newly diagnosed diabetes cohort did worse than those with known diabetes, hyperglycemia, or normal glucose. So if you had new, new uh, instance of diabetes, that might be a poor prognostic indicator. Um, phenotypic characteristics and prognosis, prognosis of inpatients with COVID-19 and diabetes, the Coronado study. So this was a big uh, multi-center study out of France with 13, uh, 17 patients with diabetes hospitalized with COVID-19. 89% had type 2 diabetes, 65% were men. Age was uh, 70 plus or minus 13 years. Median BMI was 28. 47% uh, had microvascular complications and 40.8% had macrovascular uh, complications. Uh, they found uh, that intubation or death within a week of admission was about 29% in this cohort um, with a, a positive association with BMI, uh, also associated with dyspnea on admission, white blood cell count, um, CRP, AST level. Secondary outcomes, they had a 10.6% death rate, 18% made it to discharge, Death was associated with age and obstructive sleep apnea, microvascular and macrovascular complications. And uh, fasting blood sugar as an independent predictor for 28-day mortality. Uh, this was 605 COVID-19 patients with 114 deaths from two hospitals in Wuhan. They found that fasting blood sugars of greater than seven millimoles per liter at admission was an independent predictor for 28-day mortality in those with COVID-19 without a previous diagnosis of diabetes. Um, and the relationship between diabetes and COVID-19 prognosis, this was a retrospective cohort study. Out of 80, uh, 500 patients with COVID-19, 84 had diabetes. Uh, it was associated with higher neutrophil count, CRP, procalcitonin, D-dimer, lower lymphocyte count, and uh, lower albumin. They had a higher incidence of bilateral pneumonias, respiratory failure, acute cardiac injury, and death. And then um, putting this all together um, for the uh, population, um, there was a um, the risk score that was that was created uh, predicting mortality due to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is fairly helpful in sort of understanding what predicts mortality. So pneumonia uh, puts you at very high risk. Diabetes and age less than 40 years. Uh, you have risk uh, age greater than 65 years. You have risk CKD, there's a risk factor. And then smaller things are immunosuppression, COPD, obesity, diabetes, and age less than 40 years. And they break it down into risk categories. So this is somewhat helpful for the clinical uh, understanding. And then Holman looked at risk factors for death in those with diabetes. And you will notice on this slide here that age was a very good indicator. So if you were less than 40, very low chance that you're gonna have a bad outcome. Uh, they found 
that A1C, there was an inverted U shape to the curve. So those with very low A1C may also be at risk, uh, but certainly those with higher A1Cs were at risk. Um, and then similarly with BMI, an inverted U shape. So what effect has lockdown had on outpatient diabetes management? Another question of interest. And basically, uh, the studies uh, that were done were retrospective observation studies where people looked at CGM values. Um, 307 individuals with type 1 had glycemic metrics compared prior to lockdown with data after eight weeks of lockdown. And there was no significant difference. Uh, in fact, in some cases, things got better, especially in the higher A1C cohort. Um, so this may mean that people have more resources to devote to self-care. Um, and a similar study in the UK with 572 individuals so showed that time and range actually increased from 53 to 56%. Um, there was no significant association with deterioration in glycemic control. So what effect has COVID-19 had on new cases of diabetes? Um, a lot of people are reporting not so much new cases, but that uh, people who would normally be coming in uh, with cases are now presenting more frequently with DKA. And in the uh, German uh, registry, the DPV, uh, they found that post-COVID, 45% uh, were presenting with DKA as opposed to 25% in 2019. And there were more severe cases, 19% versus 14%. Uh, the authors hypothesized that reduced medical services, fear of approaching the healthcare system, and more complex psychosocial factors may have played a role. And then we have expert opinion um, in the outpatient realm, um, making sure that people have good metabolic control, optimizing current therapy, um, not discontinuing therapies that are known to work early. Um, and similarly, we have uh, certainly other uh, recommendations and these are based on as much data as we, we know. Uh, some of the unanswered questions from this paper uh, are now perhaps a little more answered for you. So in conclusion, there's no conclusive evidence that the risk of developing COVID-19 is greater for those with diabetes. But if someone with diabetes develops it, there's a lot of evidence that in hospital mortality and disease severity are worse. Lockdown did not adversely affect glycemic control, and it may be beneficial to those with poor baseline control. The current epidemic has been associated with higher rates of DKA and new onset pediatric diabetes. Um, so in, in summary, there's a lot of opinion, there's a lot of observation, there's a lot of correlation, and there's a lot of hypothesis generation. Uh, but it's time to test these hypotheses, especially this one of glucose control improving outcomes. Um, and I just want to thank the, both the adult and pediatric endo teams at Stanford and uh, my mentor, Dr. Bruce Buckingham, supported by the NIDDK and Stanford Maternal and Child Health Research Institute. And really just uh, amazing thanks to Nick and the whole team here uh, for really running a, a great series of sessions and discussions on this pertinent topic. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Rayan, for that excellent um, review. Um, we had some questions coming in, um, and we'll continue to keep it open maybe for the next uh, five minutes to answer any questions uh, live. So if you want to uh, have a question on the materials that were covered, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A. Um, I'll also, also open it up to the faculty to see if there's any questions that were addressed um, and, and can also um, um, bring those questions uh, live um, if you think they should be shared. Hi, Rehan. Great, great ahead, talk. Matt. This is Matt. Um, there's a, a question that was addressed in the, in the Q&A, but also if you could speak to the differences between type 1 and, and type 2 diabetes in terms of uh, COVID-19 outcomes. Yeah, so this is this is a great question. And initially, uh, I, I was initially going to put those studies in chronological order, but you'll find 
that the earlier studies did not break it apart in any significant way, shape, or form. So I think the NHS data is probably the best data source for sort of separating out type 1 and type 2 outcomes. However, I will uh, state that, you know, the type 1 data was an order, there were an order of magnitude fewer cases of type 1 COVID than there were type 2. So, uh, you know, there is, there are obviously fewer type 1s than type 2s. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when assessing the data as well. But effectively, it seems like the type 1s had a higher risk of death if they were hospitalized with COVID. Uh, that doesn't answer the question of how many of the type 1 population get hospitalized with COVID. If there's any other questions, please go ahead and, and type it into the, um, the Q&A, um, and we can also try to take um, some time to answer them um, uh, live throughout the rest of our um, presentation um, or our session today. Um, and so a tradition now we'll move on to a case uh, presentation from the community. Um, today we're going to try to just summarize and, and look um, uh, back on the past 15 weeks of cases that have been um, submitted um, by attendees um, and, um, and, and what we've addressed on this program and then move on to high impact question follow up. Um, if you could advance the next slide. Um, so the, we had 15 case presentations uh, that we reviewed. Um, so overall, we're a middle age uh, population, um, um, uh, more females, um, majority type two, uh, but um, complex uh, uh, diabetes of over two thirds requiring um, insulin and with A1C very close to poor control with an average A1C of 8.7 plus or minus um, 2.6. Um, CGM use encouraging, it's um, higher than the general population at 33% and insulin pump use only 13%. Uh, only um, uh, percent. So lots of questions um, about complex diabetes, insulin requiring, um, and about half of those also using adjunct um, medications to insulin. Next slide. Um, and there aren't enough specialists um, to, to take care of all patients living with diabetes. And we, we acknowledge that um, primary care providers are managing complex diabetes. And this really speaks to the complexity of, uh, of diabetes, um, where a third uh, had had ER visits in the past year, um, and close to 50% also dealing with uh, the double burden of, of behavioral health issues and, and depression in addition to diabetes, and then you put that on top and uh, the time of COVID um, and, and things get very complex. Um, and these are barriers uh, to, to treatment that were reported. Um, and as we've highlighted throughout our series um, um, and data that we've reported in our ECHO diabetes programs in, in California and, and Florida, is this lack of, of social support and trying to meet the need to try to connect other people living with diabetes um, and um, access and, and utilization of supplies was perhaps reported more, more of an issue than actual financial, even though there's um, lots of financial burdens right now in the time of, of COVID, trying to get through loopholes of how to get patients on certain medications or coverage for CGM. Um, we discussed a lot. And once again, coming back to behavioral health, um, the underlying, underlying psychiatric comorbidities adding to the complexity of, of diabetes. Um, so I, I thank you all for, for submitting um, uh, these cases and having rich conversations um, um, and, uh, and hope you found those beneficial. Uh, and would encourage you to reach out to your local echo diabetes, echo diabetes or echo endocrinology programs um, in the respective states that our faculty team represents um, and consider joining uh, their programs as well. Um, now we're going to move on um, to a summary of um, high impact follow up questions from this series that um, different faculty members are going to address. Um, and the first question is, should we be more concerned about DK during the time of COVID? Um, Eleni, do you want to uh, address this for us? Absolutely. So as um, Rehan just 
explained to us, the data is emerging and uh, we don't know for sure uh, other than um, we do know that there was an increased rates of DKA and new onset pediatric diabetes. But other than that, we don't know for sure. But what we do know is that managing diabetes during illness is challenging. Um, and so what we really want to do for our patients is to emphasize prevention. So follow the CDC guidelines um, and tr do your best to prevent any uh, development of illness. Help your patients prepare just in case they do get sick with sick day diabetes management plans and make sure that they have adequate supplies of medications and diabetes and provide support for them. Let them know that you're there to help them. So key points that you want to give to your patients, make sure that they know that they should continue taking their medications and do not stop taking their insulin or change their doses without talking to the provider first. So many times people think that if they're sick and not eating, they shouldn't take their insulin. Please make sure that they know that the most important thing to do is to drink water and continue taking their insulin and then call you. So another thing is to uh, emphasize that they really shouldn't delay getting emergency care for their diabetes or other underlying condition because of COVID-19. Reassure them that there are uh, infection prevention plans in place in emergency departments and they really do need to seek emergency care when they need it. Also remind them to call you if they have any concerns um, about their health or if they get sick or think that they may have COVID-19. Again, if they need emergency assistance, call 911. So to help folks uh, create a sick day diabetes management plan, um, tell your folks to make an appointment to see you. If you are able to see them through telemedicine, great. If not, um, bring them in with all health precautions in place. Uh, make sure that your sick day management plan includes when to call you plus your phone number, foods and fluids, um, when to check for blood glucose and ketones, uh, how to um, verify that you have the correct medication, and how to adjust your insulin and medications, or also how to take over-the-counter medicines if needed. Make sure supplies include um, simple carb snacks to uh, raise blood sugar levels in case they're having hypoglycemia. Also glucagon for severe hypoglycemia. Make sure there are medications, blood glucose meter, ketone meter, um, or urine, glu uh, urine ketone test strips, masks, and personal protective equipment. There is more information about this on the diabetesdisasterresponse.org website. Again, remind them to continue taking their medications. However, if they're taking SGLT2 inhibitors, it's in, uh, advised to stop taking those due to increased risk of DKA. Check blood sugar at least once every four hours. Know the symptoms of DKA, of, uh, nausea, vomiting, headache, uh, increased respirations, increased heart rate, test for ketones if experiencing any of those symptoms, drink at least four to six ounces of fluids every 30 minutes, uh, and check their temperature and go to an emergency room if experiencing high ketones, difficulty breathing, persistent fever, or COVID symptoms. There are resources available online that you can give as handouts to your patients. Um, their links are available at the bottom of the slide. They're prepared by um, ADCES, the um, Association for Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, and the ADA. And there are many resources for providers of patients with diabetes, and these are increasing um, all the time. If your patients do need help, affording their medications and supplies. Um, there are many resources available online. Uh, Diatribe is an excellent resource uh, for both providers and patients. There are also um, excellent resources available online. Again, the Diabetes Disaster Response uh, website is excellent, and there's also a medication assistance tool, mat.org. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Eleni.
Um, another question, um, should people with diabetes withdraw from work during the pandemic? Um, Leslie, do you mind um, answering this? Sure. Um, so unfortunately, working from home is not an option for about half of the working diabetes population. In March, a survey showed that four in 10 working Americans with diabetes were in jobs that just could not be done from home. And currently, half of employed people with diabetes are going into work full time or part time. 60% of these workers are in essential industries, 22% are in healthcare, nine out of 10 are often or sometimes within six feet of others when they are at work, and only seven of 10 are required to wear a mask at work. So people with diabetes are helping to provide the service, uh, services we all depend on during this pandemic, even as it puts their own well-being at risk. Uh, so I've been asked a lot about questions about returning back to work, and I've sort of looked at the rates of COVID in their community, the associated risk of that of their specific job and how well their diabetes is controlled. Um, I've written a letter for a nurse with poorly controlled type 1 diabetes whose med surge floor was being converted to a COVID only unit. Um, I felt like that risk was maybe unnecessary and I wrote a letter to allow her to float to um, a non COVID floor. I've written a letter for a community college English professor with poorly controlled type 1 who already taught remotely for the spring and summer. It went great. She already had approval from her college to teach remotely in the fall. She just needed an additional letter from HR to make it official. So I thought that was reasonable. Um, and I've written a letter for a well-controlled type one who works in IT at a large corporation here and um, is completely capable of doing his job from home. And his corporation is trying to figure out a, a phased uh, kind of rollout of people re-entering the office. And so my letter just puts them in the last group of people being asked to return to the office. So I felt like all of those were reasonable, but the ADA is pretty vague. They just recommend that patients consult with their treating provider to make an individualized determination. So that's what I've done my best to do, but it's challenging. Um, on the next slide, there is uh, just a screenshot. This is from diabetes.org. So patients can go and use these drop down menus to learn more about their rights. And there is also a sample letter for a provider to provide to an employer that I've used a couple times and have found it to be helpful. And I think lastly, we have a list of some more resources. Thanks so much for that, um, Leslie. Um, the next um, question that uh, was submitted, how to minimize therapeutic inertia now in the time of COVID-19. Uh, Jay, do you wanna address this? You bet, thank you, happy to do it. So as we go to the, the first slide, I think the first thing I would wanna say is remember that um, we're all here for the patient and we should be working together. If we think the patient is causing the inertia or we're causing the inertia, we're not, we're not moving forward. So we all do better when we work together as a team and, and everyone is happy with that. Um, if you look at the ADA recommendations, uh, you can see right at the top, first line therapy should be not just met lifestyle, but lifestyle and metformin unless there's a contraindication. So know that you should be starting ph pharmacotherapy right away. And please make sure that diabetes education is part of your initial therapy because you know, we don't want people out driving on the roads without driver's education. Diabetes is a complicated disease. Please give them the chance to be successful with diabetes education. And then in the small box in the top upper right, you can see that small circle. And it basically says that if you're not achieving your goals, you should be titrating every three to six months, which really means that we should be actively making changes every time we see the patient. And, and while there are a million things going on in our lives that, make it, that may make diabetes not our focus, Diabetes is a progressive disease, and if we don't keep up with it, it's gonna get ahead of us. And so that's why that is so important. So if we go to the next slide. When we're looking at things that could be barriers for patients, cost is always a very important factor. And so as part of the ADA algorithm, if cost is the primary factor for your patient, we do have choices. And so, you know, metformin, sulfonylureas, and TCDs, are typically pretty low price medications and even human insulin rely on brand is also a, a relatively cheap option. So we do have options for our patients if cost is the major factor and there are many resources available for your patients. For those medicines at least, I usually like to use something like GoodRx. Um, but there are many expensive medications and there are patient assistance programs. Kelly gave us this and I thank her for that. Uh, resources that would help, her, help people get medications that are higher cost. Let's go to the next slide. 
I also know that it's important that there are some specific indications for some treatment for type 2 diabetes. So if your patient has had heart failure, if they've had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or if they've had chronic kidney disease, we have really good evidence that certain treatments are beneficial for those patients and should be prioritized. And so the algorithm there shows on the left that, that you'll be utilizing or should be utilizing SGLT2s and GLP1s more often, and maybe avoiding medications that would exacerbate those conditions. And again, if cost is an issue because all of them are expensive, we have some resources um, listed there, as well as needymeds.org. Thank you, Dan, for adding that. Next uh, slide. And then certainly we talked a lot about uh, inertia with insulin. Insulin is uh, a really heavy hitter in treatment of diabetes, but it also comes with a lot of myths and a lot of uh, cultural components. ADA recommends we intensive, intensify every three to six months, and anyone who is a, a glucose toxic with an A1C uh, above 10%. So most people with type 2 diabetes should be on insulin if they're not fully controlled by one to two years. That's certainly not been our experience to date. And we know that most people take years to get to uh, the treatment that they need to get under control. And, and as we've talked about as a theme through here, if you are an African-American or Latino-American, there are disparities and you're less likely to get those effective treatments despite having the same need. Next slide. So what are some key things I'd want you to, to walk away with? So if we're trying to help people overcome uh, inertia with insulin, please don't use insulin as a weapon. Insulin is an incredible tool that can be used anytime in diabetes. And if, if it's something that people are afraid of, they're gonna be reluctant to use it. I also always highlight to people that insulin doesn't have to be forever. I routinely use insulin for short periods of time to get someone ready for surgery, to get past an illness. So let's say through COVID, but I may be able to take them off afterwards. I think one of the most important things I'd wanna help you with is recommend that if you're gonna use insulin, be purposeful and really work towards a target so you get them to goal within three months. Remember that those glucose readings that used to frustrate people can really be reinforcing if they start to see the efficacy of the medication such as insulin, and they're gonna be happy to see that. And then remember that you always wanna look at injection sites. The last thing you want people to do is inject into non-viable tissue if they have lipohypertrophy or atrophy. As a provider, what can you do? I think it's really important to provide the first injection in the office. Most people are super nervous about taking an injection if that's not something they've done. And so helping them walk through that is really a, a, a powerful tool. Focus on fix, fixing the fasting first, which means I, for me, I use basal insulin first. Um, you wanna make sure that you let your patients know that the fasting glucose is a great parameter to titrate to. We use a weight-based dose. You know, if you start at 10 units for everyone, it'll take you forever to get to goal. Um, and then I think it's also important to have a titration schedule. Patients want to know the plan. You know, if they start on 10 units and they're on 10 units for three months and they don't see a benefit, they're frustrated. But if you start at a weight-based dose and you give them a titration plan and you say, these are the three times we're going to stop, it's going to make a big difference for them to feel like they have a plan, they know where they're going, and they know when they come back for help. Really important parameters. Next slide. And then um, the ADA is here for you. The ADA does have a living document called the Standards of Care. Um, it is continually updated. And, and if you sign up for their um, updates, you'll get them regularly. Um, I'm happy to say that I've worked on the Bridge Primaries of Care. The Bridge Primary Care comes out in parallel with the, uh, the Standards of Care, and it's like, the cliff notes for the, the standards of care. If you've ever read the standards of care, it's like 200 pages now. Um, we made a document that is about 16 to 20 pages. It's really, what are the high yield things that primary care providers need to know as it relates to the updates? There's nothing new that's not in the standards. It's really just taking the, the information and highlighting it uh, in a way that we hope is more useful for your busy practices. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jay, for that excellent um, review. And as a reminder, in the chat box, there's a few um, uh, didactic sessions that were covered during this uh, series uh, addressing therapeutic uh, inertia. Please feel free to, um, to share that with your colleagues or revisit those. Um, also, the American Diabetes Association is having a monthly webinar series on therapeutic inertia. The link is also there and it's free to ADA members as well. Um, the next uh, question was for patients with diabetes and hypertension, are there particular medications that 
should be avoided, such as uh, ACEs or ARBs? And what about captopril? Um, Mary, do you want to um, talk on this? Absolutely. And, and like all things COVID-19, um, really, this has been an evolving subject area over the past nine months, and really a question that we've addressed a few times as new information has come to light over the course of, of our clinic. Uh, I think it's helpful to look back at, at the hypotheses generated by understanding virus cell entry and the relationship to the pharmacology of the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, really, we fairly early on, it was recognized that COVID-19 hijacks the body's renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The virus uses the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or the ACE2 receptors, for the entry into target cells. Um, and, and really, on the one hand, we had a commentary in the Lancet Respiratory Journal that sort of set off a, a whirlwind, though it was just a hypothesis generating uh, article, describing the fact that uh, perhaps increased expression of ACE2 in patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes or hypertension who are treated with ACE inhibitors or ARBs uh, might result in upregulation of uh, the ACE2 receptor, which would facilitate infection and potentially increase susceptibility or risk of severe disease. Um, so again, early on, I think we had this connection that ACEs or ARBs or other medications might increase ACE2. ACE2 facilitating uh, COVID viral entry into certain cells, and that would in fact be correlated with bad or worse outcomes. On the flip side, we had alternative hypotheses generated by researchers and clinicians that have, have suggested the contrary, that ACE2, in fact, catalyzes the conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 through 7, um, which have uh, protective effects, vasodilatory properties, and, and lung protective functions um, that really means that ACE inhibitors or ARBs might, in fact, have a, a protective effect against the ARDS observed in patients with, uh, with COVID infection. So these hypothesis generating papers really spurred some prospective investigation into this area. And the jury isn't completely settled with regards to protective uh, effects of ACE um, or, or medications that target the angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, but I do want to point out that just yesterday we had the results of a first prospective randomized study uh, in hospitalized patients continuing or discontinuing their ACE inhibitor or ARB. Uh, that was the, uh, the BRACE COVID study um, released at the, uh, I think it was the European Cardiology Conference that told us really no difference in outcomes uh, for patients who kept taking their ACE inhibitors or ARBs um, versus those who stopped taking them in 30 days post-COVID infection. In short, I think we need to remind our patients that really taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs should not um, be discontinued unless there is another compelling indication beyond just having a COVID infection. Um, that, that really at this point, the literature suggests that continuing these agents uh, benefits are likely to outweigh any theoretical risks um, we don't have evidence at present to suggest harm, and there have been some observational studies, in fact, suggesting uh, beneficial effects and outcomes in patients with COVID-19 continuing these agents. We also have ongoing studies evaluating other RAS modulators um, as part of a, a COVID-19 treatment scheme, uh, recombinant human ACE2 and Losartan. And there's also some late-breaking data and interest in this bradykinin hypothesis, which suggests perhaps an imbalance between RAS and bradykinin production might, which might in fact explain the vascular and pulmonary effects associated with COVID. Um, so again, I think there's more information to come here. And just in, in, as part of my final slide, um, I, I just wanted to describe that, you know, this may not be a class-wide effect, that um, all ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers may not be equivalent with regards to these pulmonary effects. There was a data mining analysis published in the Journal of the American Pharmacists Association with results suggesting that captopril, in fact, might have a higher incidence of pulmonary adverse effects relative to other ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So just that some things to consider um, to allay your patient's concerns with regards to continuing or discontinuing ACE inhibitor or ARB use, um, and the fact that not all agents in this class um, may be equivalent with regards to these effects. I think there's a lot more we have to learn. So, so stay tuned for, um, for what's coming. And just some resources. Thanks um, so much. Yeah, just some resources. Go ahead. 
I, I think it's a, a great, if, if you'd like more information, um, the Nephrology Journal Club website has some, some great detail that goes into these hypotheses, and also the medical letter, just for a summary of the emerging data regarding treatment of COVID-19. Thanks for that, Mary. Um, and another question that came up, um, what resources are there to reduce the cost of CGM? Um, this is a, um, a big topic throughout our series. Um, Kelly, do you want to uh, try to tackle this? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're muted, Kelly. Great. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Um, you know, this has been really interesting um, to look at some of the new research that has come out um, from DQNA, which is a social research organization that does a lot of work um, asking patients how they feel. What they actually found is from, from some surveys with hundreds and hundreds of patients um, that even if they were not wearing CGM, the reason that they weren't wearing it um, sometimes was because of costs, as, as you have heard. And often it was, they're interested, but, but they really hadn't been asked about it or given the opportunity, et cetera. Um, we have been, although in California, <laughs> we still don't have um, Medi-Cal covering CGM. There are a lot of states where Medicaid is covering it and is covering it well. It's not all 37. It's certainly not all 50, as you can see here. Um, but you can see the ones where there is um, very good coverage that green is type 1 and type 2. We know as well that there are sometimes barriers in the states um, where it's technically covered, um, but it might be more hoops to jump through, but we're getting there. You know, there has been so much amazing advocacy work done by so many doctors and nurses, so many healthcare providers, probably many of you are some of those folks. Um, so that you know, the, um, the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2 um, has just come out and that also is continuing to be $109 per month. Um, which is definitely a big amount of money for many people. But again, if there's some, some many, many commercial insurance and some, um, some folks can get that covered completely by Medicare um, if they're on MDI or even now if they're on some kind of basal insulin, there are some, um, some of the requirements have been a little bit softened. Um, Dexcom, um, although Dexcom is more, we do expect it to be coming down in price as time goes on. And there is a brand new um, G6 Pro that a lot of patients have really learned a great deal from. And sometimes, you know, the patients, um, their lives have changed, you know, their interventions need to be different, the therapy should be different. Of course, 24 seven patients can see what food is doing, but it's really valuable even just to have the pro, the two week, that's very, very well reimbursed. Um, there are a couple of other ones on here, Medtronic, Sensionics. Um, Sensionics also has a, a 180 day coming. They're even working on a once a year sensor. Um, so there is a really a lot of progress here and I'm, I've been excited to see that. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and just to say that some of the criteria for Medicare was dropped um, and that has gotten a little bit easier. We do know, of course, that it's not, it's not so easy everywhere. And we also have definitely heard that even though CMS has dropped some of the requirements, um, it still can be the distributors uh, might be making it harder to get because they don't think it's going to last, things like that. That's kind of hearsay, but diatribe.org slash CMS has more on that for Medicare. And we can go to the next slide. Yeah, these are just some of the other um, provider resources that Mary was so amazing to um, put together. Uh, we, we do think there has been a lot that has been improved and the advocacy is going to continue, um, everyone. Um, on the patient front who has been getting their um, hands on CGM. So many people have really benefited with all of your help. And those are some, just some articles. I know that's a lot of words. Diatribe.org slash access is where you can find most of those. So thank you very much. Um, thanks so thanks. much for that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah you're welcome. And, that, and those are very easy things to find on our website as well. So thank you. Um, and another question um, that came up, um, 
requesting a first to review racial differences on the effect of COVID-19 on diabetes management uh, issues specific to, to race and age. And we've touched about on this um, on previous sessions and also today, but Ashby, maybe if you could also address this a little more in depth, it'd be great. Sure, we are seeing uh, differences in terms of outcomes in a time of COVID-19 based on race and ethnicity in the United States. And while data are still being inconsistently reported, and I actually have a link here that's a great reference to a John Hopkins website that shows about reporting on race and ethnicity in a time of COVID. Even though these data are limited, we do know from data we have access to consistently that specific communities are being impacted. So if you look at who is most likely to be hospitalized for very serious uh, COVID-related complications, and also who is most at risk for dying from COVID-related complications, we know that Black communities in the United States face disproportionate risk. American Indian communities in the United States face disproportionate risk and also Hispanic communities. Next slide. Why do we see this? Um, COVID is revealing what is. So COVID is revealing existing disparities that are pervasive in the United States and that impact the communities we serve that live with diabetes. And so when we look at things like the social stratification of the workplace, we had great um, dialogue from our panelist, uh, Leslie, about people who need help right now in terms of not going to work and who is able to stay home from work. And we know that there are racial differences in terms of the stratification of the workplace that, that put minorities at disproportionate risk right now for uh, not being able to stay home and being more exposed during a time of COVID. There's residential stratification in the United States. There's differences in terms of multi-generational living patterns. And also there are already pervasive differences in terms of who is at risk for economic inequality. So what we're seeing during a time of COVID is the amplification of a, a system where people who are black in the United States, who are Hispanic, and who are um, from American Indian communities are now bearing the brunt of this disease in unique ways. Next slide. What do we do to address racial disparities in a time of COVID? You heard from Eleni about how important sick day management and planning is. So for your patients, it is especially essential when you're serving minority communities who live with diabetes that you emphasize protective measures to reduce COVID-19 risk. We have a hyperlink here to the CDC guidance on how to especially support communities who are minority in the United States during a time of COVID. And also all of the resources that have been provided about sick day management are gonna be especially pertinent for your minority communities. We also wanna emphasize how important it is to screen for food insecurity and to have resource guides readily available for your communities that you serve in terms of how they can access things that help them during a time of COVID, whether that's supplies or food banks. We have, again, a hyperlink here to a really uh, widely used and validated two-item scale that will help you put in place in a clinical setting an easy way to screen for food insecurity so you can be responsive to those needs. Next slide. Beyond COVID-19, we appreciate so much the opportunity in this series to talk to, to primary care providers because you play such an important role in terms of being able to reduce uh, disparities in diabetes because you are doing more care for especially adults in the United States with diabetes than our endocrinologist. So when we think about how we can address uh, disparities in diabetes, you are our champions. We would encourage you to avoid narratives that place individual level blame for disparities in health outcomes. So right now, um, when people are talking about differences in outcomes, uh, the, the way we talk about it should reflect um, discussions about systemic inequality that have produced differences in outcomes rather than individual level failings. Strive for diversity in your staff and seek stakeholder engagement. We also encourage you to recognize culturally sensitive and inclusive approaches to nutrition guidance and diabetes. So a key part to thriving with living with diabetes includes um, talking about and reflecting on what we eat, but make sure you do that in ways that do not denigrate people's food ways or alienate them 
from, from rituals that are central to who they are. We also want to emphasize, and this is a good um, follow up to Kelly's great resources that she gave you related to CGMs, but the more we can address disparities in technology use in diabetes, the more we're going to be able to tackle um, disparate outcomes. So we know that there are differences in terms of who is able uh, to utilize CGMs, and this is not just an issue of coverage. Um, we are not always presenting patients equally with the opportunities to learn about these technologies. So please, everything you can do to um, increase awareness for everyone in terms of your staff, as well as your patient panels about the helpfulness of CGMs and technologies, this will help us combat disparities in diabetes. Finally, we just want to draw your attention to the ADA's current initiative, Health Equity Now. And so if you um, are interested, we have the information here. And this is also a way that we can collectively raise our voices together to advocate for our patients. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, um, Ashby. Um, Another uh, question is, what are uh, reasonable COVID-19 precautions in people with uh, diabetes? Um, Dan, do you want to address this? Yes, thank you so much, Nick. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for participating in this and for including me in it. I really appreciate it. Uh, these are things everybody knows. So I know we're running out of time, and I will be brief. But I just want to emphasize the things that are so obvious that we forget them, that this is a novel virus. Nobody is immune to it at all. There is no good treatment. It's airborne and it's got a high case fatality rate compared to, compared to infections like influenza. And so there is nothing else that we can do but mitigate. And creating a culture of caring for others is the mechanism for mitigation. This is the CDC slide that recommends hand washing, avoiding touching your face, distancing, masking, and, uh, and disinfecting. You know this. I'm going to put in the chat there about uh, uh, Atul Gawande has a great article about uh, approaching this. Next slide, please. So screening is something you can do. Have you been around anybody sick? Have you been diagnosed? Have, are you, have you been in a risky environment screening yourself and others? Next slide. This is an excellent uh, tool from the, uh, from the nurse that the nursing homes have been using. And it's got on number two, you can look at this later, but on num number two, it has a list of symptoms that are screening questions for symptoms. Next slide, please. So basically there's five things. In addition to screening, you can protect others. If you don't, if, if you have symptoms, stay at home, don't go out, don't infect other people. If you don't have symptoms, wear a mask to prevent asymptomatic spread. You can protect yourself by washing your hands and not touching your face. And then there's environmental uh, things you can do that is keeping distance and wiping down the surfaces. And remember that nothing on its own is that effective, but together, these things, in the Gawande article, he talks about the 75,000 people that worked at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital and how few of them got infected during the, during the early, type, early times when we didn't know even that much about it, but people were doing good mitigation efforts. So people with diabetes should mitigate as much as anybody else and uh, and it's it it's it is what you know, and it is the answer until there is a vaccine or herd immunity as the as the end game. This is the only treatment we have. Thank you for asking me to do the most important talk today. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, so much for um, for that. Um, and we'll move on to our final question and uh, realize we're out of time. We're going to go about five minutes um, over time for those of you who want to um, uh, stay on before we close up. And the, uh, the last question we wanted to review today was how depression may affect or worsen diabetes control during social distancing and stay at home uh, orders. Uh, Jesse, do you want to take this one on? It would be my pleasure. Thank you. 
So depression and diabetes distress affect diabetes management in at least two ways. Through the mind, it makes the person less motivated and interested, and also the body, the person is less likely to be active in doing tasks. So depression and distress were problematic before COVID, and now that we're in the COVID era, the effects are likely exacerbated due to several factors. One is people are less physically active, and that can lead to more depression. Also, people's eating patterns are different and they may have less motivation to change them. There are also fewer daily routine changes and distractions, which are really important in trying to ignore and get away from depressing and distressing thoughts. And also, people with diabetes have, may have more concerns about their health and are nervous to resume activities in fear of exposing themselves to COVID, which is totally appropriate. Also, networks to receive support have really changed and some may be gone, like in-person support groups and, you know, as well as just daily interactions with others. And I do want to point out that loneliness is a major risk factor for depression. And with limited interactions with other people, there's often less opportunity to recognize that someone is depressed and have other people give you the feedback that you've been acting differently or are experiencing functional impairment. So we really encourage you to monitor depression frequently among patients using questions or data reports and to connect patients with behavioral health at the first sign of depression or distress. Thank you.